In this presentation, we are going to cover the chapter 16 through 22 in 1st Nephi. As you can see, that's quite a long block, so hang in there and endure to the end, and let's see what these things teach us. I would also recommend that you read the chapters, since I don't necessarily go over the verses themselves, I just give insight and commentary on the verses. So you may want to read it beforehand, and then you'll be familiar with the verses and the verbiage. So let's start with 1 Nephi chapter 16. 16 verses 1 through 3. The nature of men has, has ever been the same. Characteristically, the righteous rejoice in the word of God, while the wicked are offended with it. Wickedness and truth are no more compatible than light and darkness. Those who leave the church clothed in deeds of darkness find it difficult to leave the church alone. All too often they are found attempting to expose the church or demean its doctrines, activities necessitated by their guilt. For they realize that if the church is true, they are servants of darkness and must needs repent. The phrase, truth cutteth them to the very center, meaning... Teaching the same principle to those of our day, the Lord has said, Behold, I am God. Give heed unto my word, which is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, to dividing asunder of both joint and marrow, therefore giving heed unto my word. Doctrine and Covenants 11.12 The imagery of a two-edged sword is that it cuts both ways. It cuts the wicked and their wickedness in their heart and exposes them. And it pierces the righteous with the piercings of the whispings of the small, small spirit of the Holy Ghost. And so that's kind of the idea between that imagery. Elder Nilay Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained why we should accept the Lord's correction, even if it is painful. Quote, God is not only there in the mildest expressions of his presence, but also in those seemingly harsh expressions. For example, when the truth cutteth to the very center. This may signal that spiritual surgery is underway, painfully severing pride from the soul. End of quote. Chapter 16, verses 5, 4 through 5. That there is no salvation in brief flirtations with the words of truth was evident in the lives of Nephi's brothers. For a brief period they walked in the path of righteousness, yet they never found the resolve to continuously pursue its course. That a flash of religious zeal, a mo momentary commitment by themselves are of little or no worth was amply demonstrated in the events of the brothers' lives. Chapter 16, verse 6, the phrase, My father dwelt in a tent in the valley Lemuel. The family of Lehi may have remained in the valley of Lemuel for an entire season, making preparations to continue their journey. For that period, Nephi recorded only that which was given him and his father by revelation, that being what we know as 1 Nephi 8 through 15. Matters of pure temporal concern were not recorded on the small plates. Nephi's preoccupation was with writing the things of God. In so doing, Nephi established an appropriate pattern for all who would seek to edify and bless future generations through the keeping of personal records. He gave his greatest attention to those things of greatest worth. Chapter 16, verse 7, the phrase, Daughters of Ishmael to Wife. During the journey from Jerusalem to the valley of Laman and Lamuel, Laman, Lamuel had violently clashed with Nephi. They had even bound him and plotted his death. At this time, two of Ishmael's daughters had sided with Rubelli's brothers, while another of his daughters, along with their mother and one of her brothers, pleaded that they free Nephi. It seems a natural assumption that the girls' siding with Laman and Laman would become their wives, 
while their courageous sister eventually became Nephi's wife, Zoram having married the oldest girl. After reading about the marriage between Lehi and Ishmael's families, we are told that Lehi had fulfilled all the commandments the Lord had given him. Marriage is central to the Lord's plan for salvation. The first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles declared the Lord's view on marriage, quote, The family is ordained of God. Marriage between man and woman is essential to his eternal plan. Children are entitled to birth within the bonds of matrimony and to be reared by a father and a mother who honor marital vows with complete fidelity. Happiness in family life is most likely to be achieved when founded upon the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So a central part of God's plan is marriage between man and woman. In Doctrine and Covenants section 132, there it gives a definition of what it means to be God, to have eternal lives, meaning being married and having spirit children. See, this is why homosexuality and lesbianism and all the other stuff will never be a part of God's plan or be sanctioned by God. Chapter 16, verse 8. Thus my father hath fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord. This verse leaves the impression that Lehi had been commanded of the Lord to see that his sons were properly married. The antecedent of Nephi's expression that he had been blessed of the Lord exceedingly seems to have been his marriage. If this is the case, it is a touching tribute to his wife, who, according to Hebrew tradition, remains unnamed. The Book of Mormon, like the Bible, is in the Hebrew tradition of a patriarchal narrative. This seems explicitly likely when it is remembered that Nephi was writing 30 years after his marriage. Chapter 16, verse 10, a round ball of curious workmanship. In the previous verse, the Lord commanded Lehi to commence his journey into the wilderness the next morning. Singularly, the Lord, who constantly unfolds the destiny of men in piecemeal fashion, did not give him the direction he should pursue. This undoubtedly became a matter of fervent prayer on Lehar's part during the night hours. We can but imagine his astonishment and pleasure the next morning upon finding in the doorway the brass ball of curious, that is, skillful workmanship, which would become his compass throughout his journey to the promised land. This Syric device, later identified by Alma as the Leahona, was certainly not a compass in the conventional sense. Rather than identifying magnetic north, it pointed the direction that they should travel. At, at times, writing would appear giving directions or appropriate reproval for sin. Further, the Leahona proved to be a reflection of their faith as it would provide direction only as they were faithful and obedient. This is also a description of how the Holy Ghost works in our lives, pointing the direction we should go forth in life according to our diligence and faith. So you could say that the Leahona was a type of the Holy Ghost. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the purpose of the Leahona and compared it to the Holy Spirit in our day, quote, the Leahona was prepared by the Lord and given to Lehi and his family after they left Jerusalem and were traveling in the wilderness. This compass or director pointed the way that Lehi and his caravan should go, even a straight course to the promised land. The pointers in the Leahona operated according to faith and diligence and heed of the travelers and fell to work when family members were contentious, rude, slothful, or forgetful. The compass also provided a means whereby Lehi and his family could obtain greater understanding concerning the ways of the Lord. Thus, the primary purpose of the Leahona was to provide both direction and instruction during a long and demanding journey. The director was a physical instrument that served as an outward indicator 
of their inner spiritual standing before God. It worked according to the principles of faith and diligence. Just as Lehi was blessed in ancient times, each of us in this day has been given a spiritual compass that can direct and instruct us during our mortal journey. The Holy Ghost was conferred upon you and me as we came out of the world into the Savior's church through baptism and confirmation. By the authority of the Holy Priesthood, we were confirmed as members of the church and admonished to seek for the constant companionship of the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. As we each press forward along the path of life, we receive direction from the Holy Ghost, just as Lehi was directed through the Lehona. For behold again I say unto you, that if ye shall enter in by the way, and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you, all things that you should do. Elder Bednar is quoting 2 Nephi 32.5. Continuing Elder Bednar's quote, The Holy Ghost operates in our lives precisely as the Leahona did for Lehi and his family, according to our faith and diligence and heed. End of quote. Chapter 16, verses 13 through 32 Having seeds, provisions, and their heaven-sent compass, the little band set forth. They traveled four days in a south-southeasterly direction before camping at a place they named Shazur. Here they replenished their meat supply and then continued their journey. After traveling for many days, they again camped, much in need of both food and rest. It was at this point that Nephi broke his steel bow to add to their difficulties. The bows of his brothers had lost their spring. At this point, too, not only did Laman Lamiel and the sons of Ishmael begin to complain, but also Lehi, obviously much fatigued, began to murmur against the Lord. Of the entire family, the record states that they did suffer much, much for the want of food. Responding to this very difficult situation, Nephi made himself a bow and some arrows and then wisely went to his father to seek inspiration and in finding gain. It is interesting that it appears that only Nephi thought of making a bow and arrow, perhaps showing his rightful role as the leader in the family. That is interesting. Why didn't Laman and Lamiel think of making a bow? Maybe it had to do with Nephi being guided by the Holy Ghost and being able to have those insights while the brothers, being wicked and without the Holy Ghost, could not see and comprehend on how to solve problems. So maybe we should learn that part of problem solving on earth is going to be our need and how effective we can use the Holy Ghost. This had a desired effect on Lehi, who felt truly chastened by his own request, son's request, and who, from the depths of his own humility, ascended again to the role of inspired patriarch and prophet to his family. Lehi was then chastened and directed by the voice of the Lord to look upon the ball, heeding the things which were written. Nephi did not tell us what was written upon the Leahona. The fact that it caused Lehi, Laman, and Lamiel, the sons of Ishmael, and their wives to fear and tremble exceedingly indicates that it was a very sobering message, possibly foreshadowing the consequence of their faithless and disobedient behavior. Thus Nephi was instructed as to where he would find game, which he did, causing great rejoicing among the family. All were humbled and gave thanks to God. Elder Neil A. Maxwell shared how great lessons often come after difficulties. Quote, Nephi's broken bow doubtless brought to him some irritation, but not immobilizing bitterness. After all, he was just trying to feed the extended family, so why should he have to contend as well with the broken bow? Yet out of that episode came a great teaching moment, irritation often precedes instruction. 
and perhaps again why Nephi was able to get through the irritation because of his ability to rely upon the Holy Ghost. Maybe that is what will get us through our irritations so we don't complain and murmur and charge God foolishly. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that adversity can help stimulate necessary growth in our lives. Quote, May I share some suggestions with you who face the testing that a wise Heavenly Father determines is needed even when you are living a worthy, righteous life and are obedient to His commandments. Just when all seems to be going right, challenges often come in multiple doses applied simultaneously. When those trials are not consequences of your disobedience, they are evidence that the Lord feels you are prepared to grow more. He therefore gives you experiences that stimulate growth, understanding, and compassion, which polish you for your everlasting benefit. To get you from where you are to where he wants you to be requires a lot of stretching, and that generally entails discomfort and pain. End of quote. The loss of Nephi bow raises doubt in Lehi's colony, causing some to turn from God and focus on the negative. Elder Robert D. Hills of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles counseled us to turn to the Lord when we face trials. I have come to understand how useless it is to dwell on the whys, what-ifs, and if-onlys for which there likely will be given no answer in mortality. To receive the Lord's comfort, we must exercise faith. The question, why me, why our family, why now, are usually unanswerable questions. These questions detract from our spirituality and can destroy our faith. We need to spend our time and energy building our faith by turning to the Lord and asking for strength to overcome the pains and trials of this world and endure to the end for, the gr for greater understanding. End of quote. Murmuring and complaining seemed to have become second nature for Laman and Lamuel. Even Lehi had become discouraged enough that he murmured. Elder Marion D. Hanks of the Presidency of the Seventy emphasized Nephi's great character and how he approached this crisis. What to do? Nephi says he made a bow, an arrow out of some available wood, got a sling and stones, and I said unto my father, Whether shall I go to obtain food? It is a simple thing, isn't it? This means that Nephi went to his father and said, Dad, the Lord has blessed you. You are his servant. I need to know where to go to get food. Dad, you ask him, will you? Oh, he could have done, oh, he could have gone to his own knees. He could have taken over. I count this one of the really significant lessons of life in the book. And I repeat, the pages are full of them. A son who had strength enough and humility enough and manly enough to go to his wavering superior and say, You ask God, will you? Because somehow he knew this is how you make men strong. That wise confidence that men builds them. Lehi asked God and God told him and Lehi's leadership was restored. Nephi truly was guided by the Holy Ghost and knew that he should not usurp the power and authority of his father who was over him in stewardship. Neither we should do that with those who are over us in stewardship as bishops and stake presidents. Uh, try to usurp their authority and get revelation for their calling. You cannot do that. If you do, it's from Satan. You can only get revelation for that which you had stewardship over. Verses six, chapter 16, verse 18. Break my boy, bow made of fine steel. Many anti-Mormons have sought to use the mention of steel in the Book of Mormon as evidence of his inaccuracy, saying that steel was not made back then. This is, assumption is not valid or true. One commentator explained the use of steel in the Book of Mormon, quote, The overall question of the use of metals by the Book of Mormon culture is an important topic that deserves detailed attention. 
There are five explicit references to metal plates and armor in the Book of Mormon. Two are references to Near Eastern weapons. The blade of Laban's sword was of the most precious steel, and Nephi's bow was made of fine steel. The existence of steel, that is, carbonized iron, weapons in the Near East in the early 6th century B.C. has been clearly demonstrated. Robert Madden writes, to sum up, by the beginning of the 7th century B.C. at the latest, the blacksmiths of the Eastern Mediterranean had mastered two of the process that make iron a useful material for tools and weapon, carbonizing and quenching. So that shows and gives proof and evidence that there was still back at that time. Chapter 16, verse 23, Nephi's confidence in Lehi. Nephi showed great humility by going to his father even after Lehi had murmured. Nephi still honored him. President Editor Taft Benson told of an experience that illustrates the principle of seeking counsel from our fathers even though they may not be perfect. Quote, Some time ago, a young man came to my office requesting a blessing. He was about 18 years of age and had some problems. There was no serious moral problems, but he was mixed up in his thinking and worried. He requested a blessing. I said to him, have you ever asked your father to give you a blessing? Your father is a member of the church, I assume. He said, yes, he is an elder, a rather inactive elder. When I asked, Did you, do you love your father? He replied, yes, Brother Benson, he is a good man. I love him. He then said he doesn't attend to his priesthood duties as he should. He doesn't go to church regularly. I don't know that he is a tithe payer, but he is a good man, a good provider, and a kind man. I said, how would you like to talk to him at an opportune time and ask him if he would be willing to give you a father's blessing? Oh, he said, I think that would frighten him. I then said, are you willing to try? I will be praying for you. He said, all right, on that basis, I will. A few days later, he came back. He said, Brother Benson, that's the sweetest thing that has happened in our family. He could hardly control his feelings as he told me what had happened. He said, when the opportunity was right, I mentioned it to Father, and he replied, Son, do you really want me to give you a blessing? I told him, Yes, Dad, I would like you to. Then he said, Brother Benson, he gave me one of the most beautiful blessings you could ever ask for. Mother sat there crying all during the blessing. When he got through, there was a bond of appreciation and gratitude and love between us that we never had in our home. End of quote. What a beautiful and wonderful story. And letting those who are in positions of authority act in that authority as he let his father be the presiding officer in his home. 16 verse 34, the place which was called Nahum. The Hebrew meaning of Nahum might be consolation from the verb Nahom, which means to be sorry, console oneself. The verses that follow indicate that Ishmael's death was the cause of bitterness on the part of his daughters, who blamed Lehi and Nephi for it. The imitation seems to be the intimation seems to be that had Lehi not brought them into the wilderness and thus subjected them to this hardship, Ishmael's life would have been Ishmael's life would have been extended. Every indication we have in Nephi's record indicates to us that Ishmael was a willing follower of Lehi and that he fully respected Lehi's prophetic calling. An Enzyme News article described an archaeological find that reveals the name Nahum in the Arabian Peninsula. Quote, a group of Latter-day Saints researchers recently found evidence linking a site in Yemen on the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula to a name associated with Lehi's journey as recorded in the Book of Mormon. 
Warren Ashton, Lynn Hilton, and Gregory Witt located a stone altar that professional archaeologists dated to at least 700 BC. This altar contains an inscription confirming Nahum as an actual place that existed in the peninsula before the time of Lehi. Chapter 16, verse 37. The phrase, let us slay our father and our brother. Again, we find Laman and Lamiel consumed with the spirit of opposition. In this instance, they had spoken of slaying both Nephi and Lehi. It would be remembered that they had previously plotted the death of Nephi, longing for the flesh pots of their Egypt, of their Egypt the world they had left behind, Laman and Lamiel, now left unto themselves, void of the spirit. It is for such to kick against the pricks, to persecute the saints, and to fight against God, seeking the blood of the Lord's anointed. Laman and Lamiel rejected the witness of the spirit and the attendant light and truth. Their urim and thumb now became the dark stones of naturalism and humanism. Having refused to trust in the Lord and his purposes, they were now unable to penetrate the veil of their own unbelief, and they sank so low as to propose killing their father and their brother. 16 verse 39, the voice of the Lord spake many words to them. Rarely are those who have given themselves up to wickedness addressed directly by the voice of the Lord. Laman and Lamiel herein share an experience with Cain, to whom God spoke directly in warning of the endless damnation that would be his if he continued his present course. Cain reacted with anger to this experience, and we read that he listened not any more to the voice of the Lord, neither to Abel his brother, who walked in holiness before the Lord. In this instance, however, Laman and Lamiel staged another of their short-lived periods of repentance. During that period, the family was again blessed with food. And I would suggest a short-lived period of repentance is probably not repentance, really, at all. Now, let's go into 1 Nephi chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 4, why did it take eight years to make this journey? In Alma 37, 39 through 43, Alma informed us that Lehi's family did not travel a direct course or did not progress in their journey because of so many occasions the Lehi ceased to work. It ceased because many of them did not exercise faith and they transgressed the laws of God. This would explain why a journey that would have been much shorter duration took so long. So, brothers and sisters, if we don't want to prolong our pain and agony, repent of our sins and get on the covenant path and receive the Holy Ghost and be guided and directed. Here is a possible map showing the way. You can see where Jerusalem is, up there by the Mediterranean Sea, and then it says Dead Sea, and then it travels down to the Red Sea. That was about 180 miles from Jerusalem to the Red Sea. And then it said they kind of stayed by the Red Sea as they made their course down, and then at one point they turned and went east and ended up in the place called Bountiful. Chapter 17, verse 5, all of these things were prepared of the Lord. Nephi gave God, not nature, credit for the good things of the earth, having had it announced to those of our day that all the thing, good things of the earth have been given for the benefit of men. We are then reminded that in nothing doth man offend God, or against none in his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand and obey in all things, and obey not his commandments. Do we confess God's hand in all things in our lives? Chapter 17, verse 6, 12 conditions that existed in the land of Bountiful. Lehi's family exceedingly rejoiced when they came to the seashore at Bountiful. Bountiful must have been a fertile area. Following are 12 conditions that existed in the land of Bountiful. 
One, fresh water available year-round. Two, much fruit and also wild honey. Three, fertile ground in both the general area and specific location where Lehi's family camped. Four, reasonable access from the interior desert to the coast. Five, a mountain prominent enough to justify Nephi's reference to the mount and close enough that he could go there to pray oft. Six, cliffs from which Nephi's brothers could have thrown him into the depths of the sea. Seven, shorelines suitable for the construction and launching of a ship. Eight, ore and flint for Nephi's tools. Nine, enough large timber to build a seaworthy ship. Ten, suitable winds and ocean currents to take the ship out into the ocean. Eleven, no population residing in the area. And twelve, nearly eastward of Nahum. As you look at that list, can't you see how Elohim, God the Father, had been preparing a place for them? so they could accomplish future commandments that he's going to ask of them. This shows how much God knows the future and can prepare the way for us. Chapter 17, verse 7, Into the Mountain The instruction of the Lord to Nephi was not to be given in the comfort of his tent. Nephi ascended the mount so that the Lord might speak to him. Mountains are nature's temples are frequently used as such by prophets and righteous men when no temple is available. The phrase cried unto the Lord. Nephi did not ascend the holy mountain to await the Lord, but to seek him. Many willingly respond to the commandment of the Lord. Fewer actively inquire as to how they might serve. 17 verses 7 through 19 Nephi's faith was manifest by his action. Nephi's response to the Lord's command to build a ship gives us insight into his remarkable faith. Other prophets have also been overwhelmed at times by tasks commanded by the Lord. Moses felt inadequate when called to live the children of, Enoch, of Israel. Enoch felt he was slow of speech and wondered why the Lord had called him. Nephi might have been overwhelmed with the thought of building an ocean-going vessel. Instead, his response displayed greater faith. Instead of, how can I do this? I do not know how to build a ship. His response was, whether shall I go that I may find ore to molten, that I make tools to construct a ship? Isn't that interesting? Instead of obsessing on his doubt, he asked, how do I get started? Nephi's confidence did not actually come from any previous shipbuilding experience. Rather, his confidence stemmed from tremendous faith in God. And so, too, likewise, will be our confidence. It is a law of heaven that, it, that its powers are extended in behalf of men only in those instances and on those matters where the powers of mind of man are insufficient. God will bless the harvest, but man must clear the land, plow and ground the ground, plant the seed, and tend the crop. In other words, God will not do what we can do for ourselves. God will not do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Nephi could molten ore, but only when God has helped him find it. He could build a ship to cross the ocean, but only when God has provided the blueprint. Such is the relationship between God and between men and God. Those without this relationship with God murmur when given assignments that appear beyond their capability instead of putting their faith in God who always provides a way to keep his commandments. Maybe we should think of that the next time we receive a uh, an assignment or a calling and we feel inadequate. Chapter 17, verses 17 through 21. Nephi's announcement that he and his brothers were to build a ship and the group was to cross the ocean was met with ridicule and contempt from Laman and Lamiel. You can see part of that because the Lamb Bandleful was lush with food and it looked like a great place to stay. And now they're being asked to leave and go to a place they've never been to. It had been eight long hard years since the family had commenced their journey in the wilderness. 
They had rejoiced in the richness of the land bountiful, and Lehi's two oldest sons at least now desired to enjoy its goodness. How unwelcome and frightening the message must have been that they were to cross the ocean in a ship of their own building. Another 2,000 years would pass before Columbus would break the chains of superstition and fear that bound the old world and would make his voyage to that same continent. There can be no surprise at the rebellion of Nephi's brothers, who, given their circumstances, could not find it easy to ridicule could not find it easy to ridicule such a message. One is left to wonder which seemed the greater task, the building of the ship or the crossing of the ocean. And so they ridiculed, and Nephi became despondent, and in his, in his despondency they found reason to rejoice. Verse 21, the phrase, we have suffered in the wilderness, meaning there can be little question that there was considerable suffering during the wilderness wanderings. Some of it they had brought upon themselves, having failed to exercise and heed the diligence necessary to receive direction from their Urim and Thummim, the Liahona. Still, even in faith and obedience, the way had not been easy. Such is not the purpose of earth life. Yet there is something sanctifying about such suffering, and as difficult as it was, it should not compare with what they ex escaped by leaving Jerusalem. Brothers and sisters, mortality was meant to be hard and to be suffering. That's a part of the condition. The test is, will you and I be able to endure the suffering because we turn to God? Chapter 17, verse 22, the phrase, We know the people in Jerusalem were a righteous people. Such was the reply of Laniel to Nephi when commanded to build a ship seeking to show Nephi that he and his father were foolish for leaving, and now they are commanded to construct a ship and cross the ocean. Just a cursory reading of the book of Jeremiah shows that the children of Israel may have outwardly performed the law of Moses, but inwardly were full of wickedness and hypocrisy. Here are some examples on why it is such a silly phrase that Laman and Samuel said, Look, we should have never left. We know the people in Jerusalem were a righteous people because they kept the outward ordinances of the law of Moses. Number one, Jeremiah 2, the Jews had forsook, forsook the Lord, changed their God, worshipped idols, and rejected the prophets. Number two, Jeremiah chapter 3, Israel and Judah had defiled and polluted the land through wickedness. Number three, Jeremiah 5, judgments were reported out upon the Jews because of their sin and blessings withheld from them. Number four, Jeremiah 6, Jerusalem was to be destroyed because of her iniquity. Number five, Jeremiah seven, the temple had become a den of robbers where the people thought they were safe just because they had a temple among them, though they listened to false prophets saying that the temple could never be destroyed. Number six, Jeremiah chapter eight, those in Jerusalem had turned to nature worship of the sun, moon, and the host of heaven instead of Jehovah. Number seven, Jeremiah chapter nine, those in Jerusalem had become adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. Number eight, Jeremiah 11, the Jews are cursed for breaking the covenant of obedience. Thus the Lord will not hear their prayers. Number nine, Jeremiah 12, the people honored God with their mouths, but their hearts were far away from the Lord. Thus, for Laman and Lamuel to say that the people of Jerusalem are a righteous people because they performed the outward appearance of the law of Moses, but inwardly they were full of idolatry and adultery, shows how misguided and full of sin they themselves were, which distorted their perception of good and evil, therefore claiming that their father Lehi had, had misjudged them. No, as all murmurs and complainers are, they had misjudged the people in Jerusalem and couldn't see the wickedness because of their own wickedness. Chapter 17, verses 29, 42, and 46, the phrase, Ye know. Laman and Lamuel had knowledge of the prophets 
and the gospel, as Nephi points out in these verses. However, they lacked intelligence, the ability to perceive truth and act upon it in one's life. Thus, they never really ever became converted. So they knew knowledge, they knew gospel principles, but they didn't act upon it. That's what intelligence is. Intelligence is the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Acting upon the principles of truth. Lamel and Lamel would never act upon it. Therefore, they never became converted. 17 verses 23 through 31. In relating the narrative of Israel's redemption from Egypt and their wilderness wanderings, Nephi confirmed the historical veracity of these events as contained in the Bible. Here one prophet testified of the works of another. Moses, in reality, parted the Red Sea, brought forth water from a rock, and filled the children of Israel in a miraculous manner. In his inspired response to his brother, Nephi compared their situation with that of their forefathers during the period of their Egyptian bondage and subsequent wilderness wanderings. Surely faith was required to accept Moses as a prophet and follow him into the wilderness. Certainly, there were those in Egypt who asked how they were to cross the Red Sea. Others asked how they would find food, and what of water and clothes, and what army would protect them should Pharaoh come after them, and what of their other enemies in the desert so anxious to attack and plunder. Could not countless questions be asked by the doubters? Yet Israel followed their prophet, and miracle followed miracle. The Lord parted the Red Sea so that they might pass through on dry ground. He destroyed the pursuing army of Egypt, fed the Israelites manna or food from heaven, and brought forth water from a rock. He scattered their enemies before them, leading them in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Notwithstanding it all, still there were those who murmured and reviled against Moses and against God. It is easier in one day to follow a living prophet. Is it easier in one day to follow a living prophet than another? Would those who murmured against Moses and his God not also murmur against Nephi and his God? And what of our day? Should there not be unanswered questions? Should it not require faith to accomplish that which the Lord has asked of us? And would we not expect modern Israel to have among its numbers those who murmur against our prophets and our God? Chapter 17, 32-35, The Land of Canaan and the Canaanites In these few verses we receive the knowledge of why Joshua was commanded to completely destroy the Canaanites and why this action was commanded by Jehovah was just. Nephi informs us that if they, the Canaanites, had been righteous, then they would have been as choice, as choice as the house of Israel. For the Lord esteemeth all flesh in one, and he is that is righteous is favored of God. Yet all are not equally favored with God. Through Samuel he declared, Them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. To those of his day the Savior said, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Further illustrating the conditional nature of heaven's love. Let me repeat that. Further illustrating the conditional nature of heaven's love. The Savior said, If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment, and abide in his love. However, the people of Canaan were ripe in iniquity because they had rejected every word of God when it was, repent, re, was presented to them. See verse 35. Therefore the land was cursed against the Canaanites and blessed unto the house of Israel. To accept the will of God is to be blessed. To reject it is to be cursed. As men are blessed and cursed for their righteousness or for their wickedness, so are the lands that they inhabit. Chapter 17, verse 36, The Lord had created the earth. The testimony of all the prophets is that the Lord created the earth, its creations was not a matter of chance, nor was it the result of divine manipulation of laws of nature. 
The testimony of the scriptures is of a creation wrought by the power of God. The phrase should be inhabited, meaning worlds are created to be inhabited. Christ is the creator of worlds without number. These worlds are peopled by the children of our eternal Father. They too are in the image and likeness of God. And they too have been granted the same promise of eternal life through the atonement of Christ and by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Joseph Smith summarized these truths in poetic form as follows. And I heard a great voice bearing record from him. He's the Savior and only begotten of God. By him, of him, and through him, the words were all made, even all that careen in the heavens so broad, whose inhabitants, too, from the first to the last, are saved by the very same Savior of, uh, of ours, and of course are begotten sons and daughters and sons by the very same truth and by the very same powers. It's in the millennial star. Chapter 17, verse 36. His children should possess it. The earth was created to be, to be possessed by the children of God. Their claim to inheritance on it must be found in righteousness. The wicked and ungodly have no rightful claim to any lands of inheritance. For instance, God promised Abraham's posterity the land of Palestine as an everlasting possession when they hearkened to his voice. 17 verse 38, the phrase, he leadeth away the righteous into precious lands. Palestine is not the only promised land, nor are the Americas. Lands is plural in this and many Book of Mormon texts. When the fullness of earth's history is made known, we will learn of many peoples with whom God made covenants concerning various lands of promise. 1740, he loveth those who will serve him to be their God. The God of heaven has never made covenants with the wicked. Independent of obedience and righteousness, he has extended no promise to any. It is common in our day to hear reference made to the unconditional love of God. If such an expression is intended to convey the idea that all will enjoy the love of God to the same degree, irrespective of what they do or how they love, such is incompatible with the testimony of the scriptures and the voice of the Lord himself. For instance, in modern revelation, he has said, I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say. But when you do not what I say, ye have no promise. God's love in order to save us is conditional. Chapter 17, verse 41. He, Jehovah, did straighten them in the wilderness. This is in reference to Jehovah sending poisonous serpents to punish the wicked rebellion of the house of Israel while in the wilderness. See Numbers 21, verse 4 through 9. The cure from the bite of the serpents was for Moses to make a brazen serpent and put it upon a pole, and then to lift it up for all to see. Those who look upon it were healed. Alma tells us that there was a type in this thing. Alma 33, 18-22 says, But behold, this is not all. There, these are not the only ones who have spoken concerning the Son of God. Behold, he was spoken of by Moses, yea, and behold, a type was raised up in the wilderness, that whosoever should look upon it might live. And many did look and live, but few understood the meaning of those things, and this because of the hardness of their hearts. But there were many who were so hard that they would not look, therefore they perished. Now the reason they would not look is because they did not believe that it would heal them. You would think just sheer curiosity would cause you to turn your head and look. How prideful they must have been. Oh, my brethren, if ye could be healed by merely casting about your eyes that you might be healed, would you not be whole quickly? Or would ye rather harden your hearts in unbelief and be slothful that ye should not cast your eyes 
that you might perish. If so, woe shall come upon you. But if not so, then cast about your eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God, that he will come to redeem his people, and that he shall suffer and die to atone for their sins, and that he shall rise again from the dead, or shall bring to pass the resurrection, that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last and judgment day according to their works. The type referred to is twofold. First, the lifting up the pole with the serpent was symbolic of the Savior being lifted up upon the cross and over to overcome the poisonous bite of Satan's temptations that can keep us from God's presence. John 3, 14-15 states, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Helaman 8, 14 through 15 tells us, Yea, did he not bear record that the Son of God should come? And as he lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness, even so he be lifted up who should come. And as many as should look upon that serpent should live. Even so, as many as should look upon the Son of God with faith, having a contrite spirit, might live even unto that life which is eternal. The second is what is the type or symbolism of the brazen serpent on the pole. I am suggesting that the serpent does not represent Christ. The pole being lifted up is representative of Christ being lifted up on the cross. But the serpent and the brazen serpent is different symbolism. Many have stated that the serpent represented Christ and his being lifted up on the cross. I suggest that the serpent represented Satan and his bite of sin that keeps us all from the presence of God. Hebrews 7, 25-26 explained, He, Christ, is able also to save them to the utmost that come unto God by, seeing, by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. In other words, Christ on the cross became us. He represented our sinful, fallen nature. And 2 Nephi 2.7 states, Behold, he, Christ, offered himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. And so the serpent would be symbolic of sin that Christ is answering the ends of the law for. Thus Christ became us, taking upon himself the consequences of our sins. The serpent and their poisonous bite and death in Numbers 21 were the consequences of sin. Rebellion against Moses, who represented and was a type for the Savior, thus rebellion against Jehovah. The serpents represented our rebellious nature of the natural man that Satan plays upon, which brings upon us death and hell, physical and spiritual death. He overcame us. Hence, Nephi states in 2 Nephi 9.10, Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. The serpent was symbolic of that awful monster of death and hell that would come up on you and I if the Savior was not crucified and atoned for sins in the Garden of Gethsemane. Thus the Savior took upon himself, when he was lifted upon the cross, the consequences of this awful monster, spiritual and physical death, died and then was resurrected. It is through his being lifted up upon our behalf because of our fallen nature that conquered Satan, 
represented by the serpent and the effects of sin, becoming victorious over the serpent's, Satan's grasp upon mankind because of the fall, which was death and hell. In the scriptures, the serpent is always associated with the devil. Two examples will suffice. Doctrine and Covenants 76 verse 28 says, And while we were yet in the spirit, the Lord commanded us that we should write the vision. For we beheld Satan, that old serpent, even the devil, who rebelled against God and sought to take away the kingdom of our God and his Christ. And second, second Nephi chapter 2 verse 18. And because he had fallen from heaven and had become miserable forever, he, Satan, sought also the misery of all mankind. Wherefore he, Satan, said unto Eve, Yea, even that old serpent who is the devil, who is the father of all lies. Wherefore he said, Partake of the forbidden fruit, and ye shall not die, but ye shall be as the gods, knowing good and evil. Therefore, the lifting up of the pole was symbolic of Christ being lifted up. However, the serpent on the pole represented the poisonous bite of Satan's temptations of sin because of our fallen nature, which all of mankind has succumbed to. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which was overcome through the atonement of the Savior upon the conditions of repentance. 17 verse 44, both the Jews of Jerusalem and Laman and Labial sought to kill Lehi. The citizenry of the kingdom of darkness do not respond to truth with indifference. Theirs is a murderous hatred. The truth of heaven can always be identified by the anger they kindle among those who refuse to repent. The phrase, ye are murderers in your hearts, refers to men will be judged by their works and, all, and by the desires of their hearts. Nephi's wicked brothers who had killed him, who would have killed him and their father had not the Lord intervened, for which desires they would be fully accountable come the day of judgment. Chapter 17, verse 45, ye could not feel his words. True religion is a feeling. It is common in anti-Mormon literature for attacks to be made on prayer and on trusting one's feelings as sources for obtaining truth. Notice that the scriptures refer to the still small voice as a feeling, not emotions. The Holy Ghost is not an emotional thing. It is his spirit touching our spirit through the feelings of truth. In the realm of spiritual understanding, both are fundamental. Truth is felt. Falsehood is often clothed in erudite and sophisticated arguments. One does not have to be able to refute the argument to know that it is false. Truth feels good. Falsehood does not. Or another way you could also say it, truth feels peaceful. Falsehood does not. Christ spoke of the inability of the wicked to understand with their heart, while the righteous understood in their hearts things too marvelous to others. So we have that feeling in the heart, which is not emotional, but it's the Holy Ghost Spirit speaking to the Spirit in us. Describing the spirit of revelation, Joseph Smith, the Lord said, quote, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. DNC 8 verse 2. Here's how you can know if something is from God or it's from you yourself. God said the Holy Ghost will speak to your mind and heart. If you feel something is right, but in your mind it doesn't logically seem right, and something seems wrong, then it's false. If you have the reverse, in your mind everything seems okay, but in your heart it doesn't feel right, then it's not of God. He will speak to your mind and your heart. They both have to be in sync together. Because of their wickedness, such understanding was lost to Nephi's brothers, rebellious brothers. Christ spoke of the inability of the wicked to understand with their heart, while the righteous understood in their hearts things too marvelous to utter. Describing the spirit of revelation, 
For Joseph Smith, the Lord said, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. Because of their wickedness, such understanding was lost to Nephi's rebellious brothers. Remember, because they were past feeling. Why were Laman unable, unable to understand the Lord's will after seeing an angel? Why couldn't they receive a spiritual confirmation of their journey as their younger brother Nephi did? Nephi identified the cause of their spiritual insensitivity as being swift to do iniquity. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency compared a person's worthiness of receiving the Spirit to receiving a signal on a cell phone. Quote, cellular phones are used for much of the communication in our time. Occasionally, however, we find dead spots where the signal coming to a cell phone fails. This can happen when the cell phone user is in a tunnel or a cannon or where there is other interference. So it is with divine communication. The still small voice, though still and small, is very powerful. It whispereth through the piercing all things. Perhaps something in our lives prevents us from hearing the message because we are past feeling. When we, we often put ourselves in spiritual dead spots, places and situations that block our divine message. Some of these dead spots include anger, pornography, transgression, selfishness, and other situations that offend the spirit. End of quote. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, describes spiritual communication this way. Quote, the Holy Ghost speaks with a voice that you feel more than you hear. It is described as a still, small voice. And while we speak of listening to the whisperings of the Spirit, most often one describes a spiritual prompting by saying, I had a feeling. Notice we never say I had an emotion. I had a feeling. Revelation comes as words we feel more than we hear. Nephi told his wayward brothers who were visited by an angel, you were past feeling that you could not feel his words. End of quote. Laman and Laman were past feeling and could not feel the words of the Holy Ghost. Elder Joseph B. Wordland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that spiritual insensitivity isn't just a problem for those with serious sins. Quote, I fear that some members of the Lord Church live far beneath our privileges with regard to the gift of the Holy Ghost. Some are distracted by the things of the world that block out the interference of the Holy Ghost preventing them from recognizing spiritual promptings. This is a noisy and busy world that we live in. Remember that being busy is not necessarily being spiritual. If we are not careful, the things of this world can crowd out the things of the Spirit. And also things and callings in the church, we can get so busy doing them that that can crowd out the voice of the Spirit. Go, continuing Elder Worthland, some are spiritually dead and past feeling because of their choices to commit sin. Others simply hover in spiritual complacency with no desire to rise above themselves and commune with the infinite. If they would open their hearts to the refining influence of this unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost, a glorious new spiritual dimension would come to light. Their eyes would gaze upon a vista scarcely imaginable. They could know for themselves things of the Spirit that are choice, precious, and capable of enlarging the soul, expanding the mind, and filling the heart with inexpressible joy. End of quote. Chapter 17, verse 46, the power of his almighty word. God has all power and manifests that power through his word. By his word, worlds are and were created and all that is upon them. Only among those given up to vanity and wickedness is the omnipotence of God denied. Chapter 17, 47 through 48, no strength. An unusual outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord is typical following by, followed by physical exhaustion. Elder Jedediah M. Grant inquired of me, Joseph Smith, the cause of my turning pale and losing strength last night while blessing children. I tell him that I saw that Lucifer would exert his influence to destroy the children that I was blessing. 
and I strove with all the faith and spirit that I could seal upon them a blessing that would secure their lives upon the earth. And so much virtue went out of me into the children that I became weak, from which I have not yet recovered. And I referred to the case of the woman touching the hem of the garment of Jesus. The virtue here referred to is the spirit of life. And a man who exercises great faith in administering to the sick, blessing little children, or confirming, is liable to becoming weak. End of quote. It appears that Nephi was transfigured before his brothers as he made his great defense of faith and sealed his testimony as a witness among them. His experience bears a kinship to that of Abinadi before the wicked priests of Noah, Christ in his ministry, and Stephen before the Sanhedrin. 17 verse 50, if I should say it, it would be done. The power of the priesthood which Nephi held enabled him to do more than ask for blessings. By that power, the righteous man can command the very elements, and they will obey. Chapter 17, verse 53, the phrase, Stretch forth thine hand, and they shall not wither. We also learn from Doctrine and Covenants, I'm sorry, that should be from and not form, Doctrine and Covenants 63, 7 through 11, that signs do not bring faith unto conversion. They are meant for those already converted and have faith, which then leads to strengthen their faith. And he that seeketh signs shall see signs, but not unto salvation. Verily I say unto you, there are those among you who seek signs, and there have been such ever from the beginning. But behold, faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. Yea, signs come by faith, not by the will of men, nor as they please, but by, by the will of God. Yea, signs come by faith unto mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God, and with whom God is angry he is not well pleased. Wherefore unto such he showeth no signs, only in wrath unto their condemnation. So that's why all the signs that Laman and Lamiel had never converted them, because signs are not for conversion. Signs are to help one who is already converted to strengthen that conversion and faith. Notice that in verse 55, they, I'm sorry, that should be the brothers say, We know of a surety the Lord is with thee. However, this sign did not convert them to act upon the righteous principles of the gospel, since later they will seek Nephi's life again. Again, knowledge is very different from intelligence, which is a, intelligence which is acting upon the truth one has come to know. As I said, they and Amen would not act upon the truth that they gained. 7 verse 55 were about to worship me, but I would not. It is appropriate that we have great respect for those the Lord has chosen as his leaders, and more especially that we honor the office they hold. It is wholly inappropriate, however, for one man to worship another. When Cornelius fell at the feet of Peter to worship him, Peter forbade him, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. When the prophet, I'm sorry, when the people of Lystra attempted to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods, the apostles rent their clothes and cried out, saying, Why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Of the heavenly messenger that visited him, John the Revelator said, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. Let's now turn to 1 Nephi chapter 18. 1 Nephi 18, 1 through 4. It was by revelation that Nephi received the necessary instructions for the building of the ship that would take the family of Ishmael, I'm sorry, Lehi and Ishmael, to the new world. This illustrates that with God all things are spiritual. The sweat and tears shed in the building of the ship were a sacrament, for the building of the ship was a form of worship and an act of faith. Not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal, neither any man nor the children of men, neither Adam your father whom I created, the Lord said. Doctrine and Covenants 29, 34. 18 verse 1, from time to time, even the greatest of prophets do not stand in a continual downpour of revelation. 
To each it comes from time to time, as they have proven themselves worthy, and as they have completed those things requisite to its receipt. The Lord has promised that inasmuch as his servants are humble, they will be given strength and blessed from on high and receive knowledge from time to time. Revelation, as with all knowledge, comes line upon line, precept upon precept. So even President Nelson receives line upon line, precept upon precept. He doesn't have a magical crystal ball where he says everything at once and Revelation is just downpoured out upon him. This is why our prophets can be infallible and make mistakes. But God will never let them make such mistakes that would lead the total church into complete apostasy. But they can make errors from time to time because they are still learning line upon line. Chapter 8 and verse 2, it was not after the manner of men. This journey made by the family of Lehi and Leishmael to their land of promise was a scriptural type. As they could not trust their temporal salvation to a ship made after the manner of men, neither can we find our way to the land of our eternal destiny and promise aboard a ship built and crafted by the man, mind and wisdom of men. Our trust cannot be in the arm of flesh. Chapter 18, verse 3, I did pray oft. Nephi was a man of prayer. He instructed those of our generation to pray always and not to perform anything unto the Lord, save it in the first place he shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ. It is also of interest that Nephi had a place of prayer that be in the mount where he would make his ritual ascent to the divine presence. As already noted, for Nephi the mount was like a temple, it being the place of prayer and revelation. The phrase, the Lord showed unto me great things. Nephi's instruction came from the Lord, surely extended beyond administrative matters. God's designs for Nephi were of greater significance than the plans for the building of a ship. Chapter 18, verse 4. A mark of spiritual immaturity is vacillation. Once more, Nephi's brothers humbled themselves and assumed the spirit of unity, yet only for a moment. 18 verse 5, the verse, voice of the Lord unto my father. It was for Nephi to receive revelation on the building of the ship and for his father to receive the revelation that the time had come for the family to begin their journey. In the economy of heaven, revelations are granted according to one's stewardship or right to receive it. Revelations are effectually play, effectually place someone in a position to manipulate or dominate others do not have a place as their source. Let me read that again. Revelations that effectually place someone in a position to manipulate or dominate others do not have heaven as their source. So God will never give a revelation to try to manipulate someone into living the gospel or to coerce them. If someone, a leader, tries to do that, then it's of the devil. Chapter 18, verses 9 through 10. They began to dance and to sing and to speak with much rudeness. Nephi properly feared that the protective blessings of the heaven would be withdrawn because of the vulgar and rabid behavior of laymen. That probably should rab be rabid, not rabbled. Sorry. Lamiel, Ishmael's sons, and their wives. Coarse behavior is never attractive to the spirit. And when the spirit withdraws, it is natural to expect the protective blessings of heaven to withdraw also. Some may erroneously conclude from 1 Nephi 8 9 that the Lord does not approve of dancing or singing. Nephi said twice that they erred when their dancing and singing led them to speak with much rudeness. The word rude refers to being harsh, vulgar, or coarse. The Lord has stated that he approves of proper dancing and singing. Note from these scriptures that we may praise the Lord through dancing and singing. Satan can use dancing or music, however, as a means of corruption and loss of the spirit. That is why the church leaders caution us about the kinds of music we listen to and how we dance. The first presidency has declared, quote, Choose carefully the music you listen to. Pray attention to how you feel when you are listening. Don't listen to music that drives away the spirit, encourages immorality, glorifies violence, or uses foul or offensive language. 
Dancing can be fun and can provide an opportunity to meet new people. However, it too can be misused. When dancing, avoid full bodily contact with your partner. Do not use positions or moves that suggestive of sexual behavior. Plan and attend dances where dress, grooming, lighting, lyrics, and music contribute to a wholesome atmosphere where the Spirit of the Lord may be present. End of quote. Chapter 18, verses 11 through 15. The Lord did suffer it that he might show forth his power, meaning the events of Nephi's story constituted an often enacted type. The sequence is ever the same. Unseemly behavior is offended at the sobering warnings of the prophet of the prophetic voice and seeks to silence it in one manner or another. Uh, let me read that again. The sequence is ever the same. Unseemly behavior is offended at the sobering warnings of the prophetic voice and seek to silence it in one manner or another. Having done so, its perpetrators lose all sense of direction and are ripe for destruction, ready to be swallowed in the depths, save they humble themselves and repent. Chapter 18, verse 16 through 20. There was nothing save it were the power of God which threatened them with destruction. No redeeming qualities were evident in the repentance of Laman and Lamuel. The pleading of their parents was of no avail, and the sorrow of their younger brother did not affect them, nor did the tears of Nephi's wife soften their hearts. Only the threat of death or personal suffering could get them to free Nephi and desist, desist from their course of wickedness. Know that they were compelled to be humble because of circumstances, which is in direct opposition to being meek, which is voluntary, voluntary humility. Verse 18, verse 23, we did call it the promised land. The Lord named what he called America's the land of promise. To its inhabitants, the name was to be a constant reminder of their covenants and obligations to God. 18, verse 25, horses. There are was controversy regarding horses in the Western Hemisphere before Columbus arrived. However, modern archaeology discoveries have shed new light on the subject. Fossil remains of true horses different from, differing very slightly from the smaller and inferior breeds of those existing are found abundantly in deposits of the most recent geological age in most every part of America, from Eschel Eschel Bay in the north of Patagonia in the south. In that continent, however, they became quite extinct, and no horse, either wild or domestic, existed there at the time of the Spanish conquest, which is the most remarkable as when introduced from Europe, the horses that ran wild proved by the rapid multiplication in the plains of South America and Texas that the climate, food, and other circumstances were highly favorable for their existence. The former great abundance of equidate, that means the taxonomy f family of horses and related animals, in America, their complete extinction and their perfect acclimatization when reinduced by man forms curious but as yet unsolved problems in geographical distribution. Chapter 19 of First Nephi. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, 2 six, two sets of plates. When the family of Lehi reached the western hemisphere, Nephi was commanded of God to make a set of plates upon which the history of the people were to be kept. He did so, recounting their journey in the wilderness and prophecies he and his father had made. This record is known to us as the large plates which apparently contained the book of Lehi some twenty years later. Nephi was commanded to make another set of plate known to us as the small plates or book of Nephi, in which he recorded only that which was sacred. Thus the book of Lehi became primarily a temporal history, while the book of Nephi became a record of prophecies and a collection of sacred events. In 1 Nephi 19, 1-6, first plates and other plates refer to large plates of Nephi. These plates refer to small plates of Nephi. Chapter 19, verses 7 through 10. The very God of Israel to men trample, that probably should do men trample under their feet. 
Nephi commenced to prophesy concerning the manner in which the God of Israel would be rejected and effect trampled under the feet of men. Clearly, some of the prophecies recorded on the brass plates were gospel, were more gospel and Christ-centered than the scriptures preserved for us in the Old Testament. They were written with greater power and clarity. From them, Nephi was able to tell his people that Christ would be scourged, spit upon, crucified, and buried in a sepulcher, and that his death would be signaled to those on the isles of the sea by three days of darkness. Elder Neal A. Maxwell, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, noted how men today often follow the same fateful thinking, quote, For many moderns, sad to say, the query, What think ye of Christ? would be answered, I really don't think of him at all. That is how many would answer today. On another occasion, Elder Maxwell taught that regardless of what the world says, we must stand fast in our testimony of the Savior. Quote, At the center of the Father's plan is Jesus Christ, man's Redeemer. Yet, as foreseen, many judge Jesus to be a thing of naught, or consider him merely a man. Whether others deny or delimit Jesus, for us he is our Lord and Savior. Comparatively, brothers and sisters, it matters very little what people think of us, but it matters very much what we think of him. It matters very little, too, who others say we are. What matters is who we say Jesus is. End of quote. First Nephi 19, 10-16 is Enoch, Nahum, and Zenos. Nephi quoted from Zenoch, Nahum, and Zenos, these who were prophets of Old Testament times, whose detailed prophecies of Jesus Christ were recorded on the brass plates. Therefore, we know they lived before 600 B.C. They spoke plainly about the life and ministry of the Messiah and the destiny of the house of Israel. Without the Book of Mormon, we would know nothing about these three prophets or their witness of Christ. Nephi's source for remarkable detailed messianic prophecy included the three prophets of the old world whose words may have been among the plain and precious things excluded from the Old Testament record. Chapter 1910 Lifted Up to be Crucified Zenoch prophesied that Israel's God would be lifted up and Nahum that he would be crucified. Enoch had also prophesied before them in response to his question, When shall the blood of the righteous be shed? The Lord told him that it would be in the meridian of time, in the days of wickedness and, ven and vengeance. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Look, and he looked and beheld the Son of Man lifted upon the cross after the manner of men. Though the sacrificial rite as found in the Old Testament was a type for the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the plain statement of the nature of his death was lost to Israel of that day. Even the great type in the wilderness where Moses raised the brazen serpent on a pole was little understood. The prophecy of the nature of his death was indeed most remarkable, crucifixion not being a form of capital punishment practiced by the Israelites. For the prophecy to be fulfilled, events would have to so conspire that Christ would be rejected and condemned by his own nation and executed by another. Which would be Rome, who used crucifixion. Chapter 19, verse 11, The Prophet. We properly make a distinction between a prophet and the prophet. In our day, we testify of many who are prophets while normally reserving the phrase the prophet for Joseph Smith, who stands at the head of our dispensation. Zeno also is of such greatness that he is properly referred to as the prophet. Of Zenos, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, quote, I do not think I overstate the matter when I say that next to Isaiah himself, who is the prototype, pattern, and model for all the prophets, there was not a greater prophet in all Israel than Zenos. End of quote. 19 verse 14, Holy One of Israel. This is one of many expressive name titles by which the Son of God is known. The name signifies that he is the embodiment of holiness and that he would come through the lineage of that chosen people. The phrase, they shall wander in the flesh, meaning, the matter cannot be stated more plainly, Israel was scattered because they rejected the Savior and his gospel. The very concept of the land of promise or a land of inheritance is a symbolic, 
representation of eternal promises or everlasting inheritances that will yet be enjoyed by those who are true and faithful, those who keep their covenants. To break those covenants is to forfeit the right or claim to their earthly counterpart. None have claim on such possessions, save it be the righteous. 19, 15 through 17, when that day cometh, Meaning, in that day, when Isaiah remembers their God, that is, accepts Jesus as the Christ, then he will remember them and the covenant which he made with their fathers. The spiritual gathering must precede the temporal gathering. In these verses, Zenos foreshadows that future day when Israel, now scattered among every nation, kid, and tongue, and people, will embrace the faith of the righteous of progenitors and thus have claim again to the promises made to them. 1919, I speak unto all the house of Israel, meaning it is common to secular scholarship to argue that Bible prophets spoke only to those of their own day. Surely this is not the case among those commissioned to write scriptural records. Here Nephi addresses himself to all the tribes of Israel, Israel of a future day, when his record would come into their possession. Similarly, Mormon concluded that volume by saying, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you, twelve tribes of Israel. That Book of Mormon prophets share that Book of Mormon prophets share a common purpose with the prophets of the old world as shown by James, who also directed his epistle to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Chapter 19, verse 21. He did show unto them, he did show unto many concerning us. The Bible, even in its fragmentary form, contains many prophetic references to this branch of the tribe of Joseph. Enoch and John the Revelator both tell the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and of course Joseph of Egypt and Zenos foretold this people's history in considerable detail. 1923, Joseph Smith said, quote, Faith comes by hearing the word of God through the testimony of the servants of God. That testimony is attended, always attended by the spirit of prophecy and revelation, end of quote. There is a powerful association with study of the scriptures that remains unknown to those who do not study them. Here Nephi attempts to expose his brothers to that power. The phrase more fully persuaded them, meaning not all scripture is of equal worth, nor does it all serve the same purpose equally well. Here Nephi preferred the writings of Isaiah over those of Moses for the purpose of teaching and testifying of Christ. The phrase, I did liken all scripture unto us, meaning gospel principles do not tarnish with time, nor do they apply with greater effect in one day than in another. The Lord has said, what I say unto one, I say unto all. The art of gospel teaching is to make timeless principles timely. Nephi did this by taking those prophecies that were made to the entire house of Israel and specifically applying them to his own family who are a part of the house of Israel. How do we liken the scriptures unto ourselves for profit and learning? Verse 23. Questions like the following ones can help us profit, profitably apply the scriptures to our lives. Here are some questions we could ask ourselves. What significance does this particular event or principle have for me today? For example, what does the rebellion of Laman and Lamiel teach me? Where can I learn about faithfulness? What can I learn about faithfulness from Nephi's obedience? If I were in that particular situation or faced with this challenge or question, how would I react? What flaws or strengths would I find in my own character? Am I like Lehi's family members who murmured in the wilderness, or am I like Nephi and Sam? Do I complain when things get difficult, or do I trust in God no matter what the circumstances? What do I learn about God and his dealings with his children from this event? As I study the lives of men and women in the scriptures, what do I learn about the things that please or displease God? Why was this particular concept, principle, or event included in the scriptures? Chapter 19, verse 24, which were written unto all the house of Israel. An essential principle in interpreting Book of Mormon prophecy will be announced here and repeated again in commentary on 3 Nephi because of its importance. 
a misunderstanding of scripture results when a prophecy made to all the house of Israel and then applied to the descendants of Lehi by Book of Mormon prophets is assumed to be fulfilled only in the activities of the descendants of Lehi. Some have erred by supposing that statements made by Book of Mormon prophets in which they applied the prophets of Old World prophets to their own people applied only to the descendants of Book of Mormon people or the Lamanites. This has led them to greatly exaggerate the role of the Lamanites will play in the events of the last days. Faithful Lamanites will play a role equal in importance to that of all faithful descendants of Abraham. Their destiny is to become as one with the tribe of Israel with whom the covenants and promises of the fathers were made. Now let's go to chapter 20 of 1 Nephi. 1 Nephi 20, 21, Introductions to the Writings of Isaiah. This is where we will now, Nephi will now start quoting chapter from Isaiah. Why did Nephi include Isaiah 48 and 49? At this point in this record, we find an answer to this question in 1 Nephi 19.21, quote, And the Lord surely did show unto the prophets of old, including Isaiah, all things concerning them, the Jews in Jerusalem, and also he did show unto many things concerning us, the Nephites in America. Why did Nephi include the writings of Isaiah throughout his record, particularly 2 Nephi 12-25? Nephi began the first of his Isaiah citations with these words, Hear ye the words of the prophet, Yea, ye who are a remnant of the house of Israel, a branch who have been broken off, hear ye the words of the prophet, which were written unto all the house of Israel, and liken them unto yourself, that ye may have hope, as well as your brethren from whom they have been broken off. For after this manner has the prophet written. Isaiah's writings testify that Christ is the only true source of hope for men and women living in a fallen world. Consequently, Nephi cited hundreds of verses Isaiah wrote that testify of the Savior. One scholar noted that of the 425 separate verses of Isaiah which are quoted in the Book of Mormon, 391 say something about the attributes or mission of Jesus Christ. Moreover, Nephi recognized that Isaiah's testimony was similar to his, mo his own. As both had seen the Lord, Nephi explained, And now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words, for I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children, for he hath verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. And my brother Jacob also has seen him, as I have seen him. Wherefore, I will send, forth their, send their words forth unto my children to prove unto them my words are true. Wherefore, by the words of three, God has said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. So Nephi, Jacob, and Isaiah have seen Christ in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Will he establish his word? The greatest validation of Isaiah's writings came from the Savior himself. While ministering to the Nephites, Jesus declared, And now behold, I say unto you that you ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you, that you search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah. For surely he spake as things touched as touching all things concerning my people, which are of the house of Israel. Therefore it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles. And all things that he speak have been and shall be, even according to the words which he spake. What happened during Le Isaiah's time, and why are his prophecies still being fulfilled today? Isaiah prophesied from approximately 740 to 701 B.C., during his lifetime, the kingdom of Israel and Judah rose in posterity, prosperity and struggled with idolatry. The unrighteous of the people led to spiritual weakness and political peril. In a short period of time, Israel and Judah became weak vassal states, cowering under the mighty Assyrian Empire. In fact, the scattering of Israel began during Isaiah's lifetime, as many Israelites from the northern kingdom of Israel were carried away captive by the Assyrians. 
Isaiah repeatedly warned of the consequences of wickedness and foretold the calamities that would fall upon the house of Israel as a result, include the scattering of Israel from their lands of inheritance and the loss of the blessings of the covenant. He also testified repeatedly that Israel's only hope could come from redemption through the Messiah. Many of Isaiah's prophecies concerning the coming of the Savior to the earth both in the millennium of time and at the millennial day. Furthermore, he gave specific details concerning the latter-day gathering of Israel and the restoration of the gospel covenant. One way Isaiah is likened unto us, just like Israel got scattered because of their disobedience, members of the church today who are of the house of Israel and they become disobedient, then they get scattered and go back into the world and follow after the world. What can help readers understand Isaiah's words? Three basic guidelines assist anyone who wishes to understand what Isaiah wrote. One, study other scripture. The scriptures themselves offer many insights into the meaning of Isaiah's writings. The Bible Dictionary states, The reader today has no greater written commentary and guide to understand Isaiah than the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. Not only do these books of scripture interpret passages of Isaiah, they contain doctrines and prophecies that shed light on Isaiah's words. These modern scriptures fill in details that are not evident in the Bible. Number two, seek the spirit of prophecy. As Nephi mentioned, those who are not filled with the spirit of prophecy in his day could not understand the meaning of Isaiah's writings. The same is true today. Each serious student of Isaiah must seek revelation through the Holy Ghost to enlighten his mind and to help them read the words by the same spirit in which they were written in the testimony of Jesus Christ. And three, study diligently. Elder Bruce Armour Conkey, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, encouraged Latter-day Saints to devote themselves to serious study of Isaiah. Quote, read, ponder, pray, verse by verse, thought by thought, passage by passage, chapter by chapter. As Isaiah himself asked, whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? His answer, them that are weaned from the milk and draw from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. End of quote. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 2. These verses are addressed to those of Israel who profess, whose professions of allegiance to the Lord were not sustained by works of righteousness. Their actions proved them hypocrites. Chapter 20, verse 1, out of the waters of baptism. This clause first appeared in 1840-1842 edition of the Book of Mormon. It did not appear again until 1820 edition, and it has been in all editions since that time. It appears to be a prophetic commentary by Joseph Smith to explain the meaning of the phrase, quote, out of the waters of Judea, unquote. Such editorial comments by modern rulers of grammar would be identified by the use of brackets. If this place were a restoration of the original text as found in the more pure version on the brass place from which it comes, it would have appeared in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. And we would also expect to find it in the Joseph Smith translation of Isaiah 48.1, but we do not. So it's Joseph just adding a clarification later, using his gift as prophet, seer, and revelator. Through the use of this phrase, Joseph Smith is calling our attention to the fact that the ordinance of baptism was as common to the people of the Old Testament as it was to the people of the Book of Mormon. The duplicity spoken in these verses was that of baptized members of the church. 20 verse 1, swear by the name of the Lord, meaning to Israel of our modern day, the Lord has said, all things must be done in the name of Christ, whatsoever you do in the Spirit. To Father Adam, the Lord said, thou shalt do all things that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt, I'm sorry, that should be shalt, repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. This may well be an ancient expression of that principle found in the practice of appealing to God as, wit as a witness to oath, covenants, and life expressions, thus certifying the truth of what was being said. 
chapter 20, verse 2, they call themselves of the holy city. That phrase meaning salvation is not obtained by living in a particular place, but rather by living in a particular way. There are no holy cities without a holy people. The phrase Lord of hosts means this name title for Christ dramatizes his place at the head of the army of God. He is a man of war and a God of battles. The phrase is the same as the Lord of Savaot. That means the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of hosts, God's army. Chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. Things known only to God were foretold to Israel by prophets to evidence the supremacy of Jehovah over the gods of the heathens. 20, verse 4. The neck is an iron sinew, meaning Israel from the beginning was stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Chapter 20, verse 6 through 8, having prophesied events long in advance, the Lord now prophesied things on the eve of their happening, things not previously recorded, thus none could say they already knew them. Chapter 20, verse 8, the phrase, a transgressor from the room, meaning Israel has always been wayward and rebellious from the time of its formation on earth. It may also be that this statement has reference to a particular propensity among some of the wickedness demonstrated in the pre-mortal life. 20 verses 9 through 11. Here the Lord says that for his name's sake and for his praise, he would not cut Israel off despite their wickedness. The reasoning is similar to that used by Moses when he interceded in behalf of Israel after the incident with the golden calf. Moses' argument was threefold. First, they were God's people. He having brought them out of Egypt by his own power. Second, that God's glory was thus involved and would be shamed in the sight of Israel's enemy. And third, that God had covenanted with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to raise up a mighty nation from their seed. 20 verse 9, the phrase for my name's sake means, In this covenant with Abraham, the Lord said, I will lead thee by the hand and I will take thee to put upon thee my name, even the priesthood of thy father, and my power shall be over thee. Israel had been chosen to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Their lot was to labor in the name of the Lord. 20 verse 10, the phrase the furnace of affliction means, it is in the flames of difficulty that the tempered steel of faith is forged. Ease does not cause call forth greatness. Hence, one of the reasons for suffering. Dallin, Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles observed that afflictions can likewise refine and purify each of us. Quote, most of us experience some measure of what the scriptures call the furnace of affliction. Some are submerged in service to a disadvantaged family member. Others suffer the death of a loved one or the loss of a postponement of a righteous goal like marriage or childbearing. Still others struggle with personal impairments or with feelings of rejection, inadequacy, or depression. Through the justice and mercy of a loving Father in heaven, the refinement and sanctification possible through such experiences can help us achieve what God desires us to become. End of quote. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the personal sanctification he experienced following three major surgeries. Quote, In the past two years, I have waited upon the Lord for mortal lessons to be taught me through three periods of physical pain, mental anguish, and pondering. I learned that constant, intense pain is a great consecrating purifier that humbles us and draws us closer to God's Spirit. If we listen and obey, we will be guided by His Spirit and do His will in our daily endeavors. There were times when I have asked a few direct questions in my prayers, such as, What lessons dost thou want me to learn from these experiences? As I studied the scriptures during this critical period of my life, the veil was thin and answers were given to me as they were recorded in the lives of others who had gone through even more severe trials. My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. 
dark moments of depression were quickly dispelled by the light of the gospel as the Spirit brought peace and comfort with assurances that all would be well. On a few occasions, I told the Lord that I had surely learned the lesson to be taught and that it wouldn't be necessary for me to endure any more suffering. Such entreating seemed to be of no avail, for it was made clear to me that this purifying process of testing was to be endured in the Lord's time and in the Lord's own way. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 12, the phrase, O Jacob and Israel, my called, meaning the Lord addressed them by their natural name as descendants of Jacob and then by their covenant name, Israel. The phrase, my called, has reference to the foreordained foreordination given those born as the house of Israel to be the ministers of salvation to all other peoples of the earth. This foreordination was given in the pre-earth life. Chapter 20, verse 14, Israel is to assemble to hear the testimony of their God. That testimony includes the promise that the Lord will fulfill his words, which he has spoken through his prophets, and make his pleasure against Babylon and the Chaldeans, figurative representations of the Gentiles' world. The Lord hath loved him, phrase meaning a special expression of love is reserved for those prophets like Nephi and the Isaiah who have foreseen and courageously spoken of the destiny of Israel. As with other great ancient empires, Babylon's ascendancy to wealth and glory was accompanied by moral decay, wickedness, and iniquity. Babylon's corruption was so extensive that the very name became a symbol, a symbol for worldliness, spiritual wickedness, and Satan's kingdom. God decreed that the Medes, that would be the Persians, should completely destroy Babylon in its wickedness. Under the rule of Cyrus the Great, an alliance of Medes and Persians dammed the mighty Euphrates River and marched through the riverbed and under the walls of Babylon to capture the city and overthrow the empire around 538 B.C. When Isaiah spoke of Babylon, he referred both to the actual empire as well as spiritual Babylon. Isaiah foresaw the graphic destruction of Babylon of his day as a result of the great wickedness of its people. Consequently, he used the term Babylon in his prophecies to typify the spiritual condition of the latter days and the judgments that would come upon the world at the second coming of Jesus Christ. 20, 16-17, as Paul declared, this thing was not done in a quarter, corner. No saving principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be found only in an obscure text. The voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there is none to escape, and there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated. Chapter 20, verses 18 through 20. Christ is the Prince of Peace, and the citizens of his kingdom, those obedient to his laws, come to know that peace even in a world of turmoil of which they must often be a part. 20 verse 19, the phrase, thy seed as the sands. This is an allusion to the Abrahamic covenant in which seeds as countless as the sands of the sea are promised to the faithful of all ages through the covenant of eternal marriage. 20 verse 20, the Doctrine and Covenant clarifies exhortation to, quote, go ye forth of Babylon, unquote. Those who bear the vessels of the Lord must be clean, leaving the wickedness of the spiritual Babylon behind them. Now let's go to 1 Nephi 21. 1 Nephi 21 Isaiah is, is compared to Isaiah 49 is a most remarkable prophecy, one intended by the spirit of revelation to embrace multiple fulfillments. The Book of Mormon version of the prophecy, which contains significant textual restorations, greatly enhances our understanding of Isaiah's message and the workings of the spirit of prophecy. The text is a marvelous messianic prophecy, as well as a detailed description of Joseph Smith and the story of the Latter-day Restoration. It can also be prop... prop Property uh, should be proper, properly argued 
that this prophecy applies to Isaiah, or it is a description of major events in the history of the nation of Israel. Such interpretations are not inappropriate as long as they do not obscure its greater meaning as it applies to Christ and Joseph Smith. Since Nephi lived a considerable time before the coming of Christ, it was appropriate that he viewed this prophecy primarily as it applied to the coming of the Savior. Since we live a considerable time after Christ's mortal ministry, it is appropriate that we see this prophecy primarily as a price applies to the events of our day. Isaiah's detailed knowledge of the Latter-day Restoration, the role of Joseph Smith, and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon sustain this conclusion. The Word of God is most durable. We will here interpret the prophecy as it applies to the prophet Joseph Smith, for such was the pattern of our Lord in the interpretation of Isaiah he gave among the Nephites. This is a good example of the dual nature of Isaiah's prophecy that can apply to different peoples in different time periods. Chapter 21, verse 1. Hearken, O ye house of Israel, meaning only that part of Israel who hear the voice of the Lord's prophets will be part of the latter-day gathering. The prophet and those ordained under his hand are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. The Lord said, For mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. To Joseph Smith the Lord said, This generation, this generation shall have my word through you. The phrase, all ye that are broken off because of the wickedness of the pastors, means this is a significant textual restoration. It establishes that through the, prof through the prophet is addressing, though the prophet is addressing all the house of Israel, his message is more specifically for that part of Israel that has been scattered, not through their own wickedness, but because of the corruption of the church in the old world. It was this corruption of the church and the temple priesthood that caused Lehi and his family to flee. Jeremiah prophesied the same thing, saying, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my, of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. They have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and increase, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So Jeremiah is prophesying how in his day, the leaders were not leading in righteousness, but in wickedness. And that's why Israel got scattered. And in the latter days, God would regather his people under more righteous leaders or shepherds. 21.1. Listen, O isles, unto me. Meaning, great are the promises of the Lord unto them who are upon the isles of the sea, explained Nephi. Wherefore, it says isles, there must these be more than this, meaning the Americas, and they are inhabited also by our brethren. Wickedness in the house of Israel caused the Lord to transplant various branches of the house of Israel throughout the world. The same wickedness prevented those in the old world from knowing about the brethren who had thus been scattered. The, the phrase, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, means all of scattered Israel are now invited to listen to the voice of a servant of the Lord, one called from the womb, not one self-ordained, but one rather foreordained and known by name even before his birth. All are entreated to listen to Joseph, the son of Joseph, who was ordained from before the foundation of the world. He raises the warning voice in the very language prophesied, quote, Hearken ye, people of my church, saith the voice of him who dwells on high, and whose eyes are upon all men, yea, verily I say unto you, Hearken ye, people from afar, and ye that are upon the isles of the sea, listen together, as DNC 1.1. No more appropriate language could be imagined. Words recorded by Isaiah, words to be fulfilled in the last days. Such are the words used to introduce the compilation of revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants as it announces that the kingdom of God has again been established on the earth and that the time for Israel to be gathered has arrived. 
21 2 my mouth like a sharp sword meaning a prophet speaks as one having authority in april 1829 joseph smith recorded the following prophecy quote a great marvelous work is about to come forth unto the children of men behold i am god give heed unto my word which is quick and powerful sharper than a two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of both joints and marrow, therefore give heed unto my words. End of quote. DNC 6, 1 through 2. The words of God spoken by one authority are to the worldly as a sharp sword. The phrase, he hath hid me, means to Joseph Smith and others who had embraced the newly restored gospel, the Lord said, Ye are lawful heirs according to the flesh and have been hid from the world with Christ in God. Those called to establish the kingdom of God on earth in the last great this gospel dispensation were literally the seed of Abraham, and as such were lawful heirs to the priesthood, whose lineage was preserved by the hand of God for this very purpose. The phrase a polished shaft refers to Joseph Smith gave the following characterization of himself. I am like a huge rough stone rolling down from a high mountain, and the only polishing I get is when some corner gets rubbed off by coming in contact with something else, striking with accelerated force against religious bigotry, priestcraft, lawyercraft, doctorcraft, lying editors, stubborn judges, and jurors, and the authority of prejudice. Perjured executives, perjured executives, backed by mobs, blasphemers, licentious, and corrupt men and women, all hell knocking off a corner here and a corner there. Thus I will become a smooth and polished shaft in the quiver of the Almighty, who will give me dominion over all and every one of them, when their refuge of lies shall fail and their hiding place shall be destroyed, while these smooth, polished stones which I come in contact with become marred. 21 verse 3, my servant, O Israel, referring to the servant represented in this verse is the corporate personality of the covenant people. The church is the servants of the Lord. 21 4, I have labored in vain. The work of God has never gone unopposed. Difficult, disappointment. Difficulty, disappointment, and discouragement are companions well known to those seeking to advance the cause of righteousness. While illegally imprisoned in Liberty Jail, Joseph Smith was told, The ends of the earth shall inquire after thy name, and fools shall have thee in diversion, and hell shall rage against thee. The common lot of the faithful is to suffer tribulation in their Redeemer's name. 21.5, to bring Jacob again to him, meaning the great labor of the Lord's servants was to the entire descendants of Jacob, Jacob to accept Christ as their Redeemer and then walk in his path. The phrase, yet shall I be glorious, means among the righteous, prophets are always honored, though warned that fools would deride and hell rage against him. Joseph Smith was also promised the pure in heart and the wise and the noble and the virtuous shall seek counsel and authority and blessings consistently from under his hand. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes, he was promised, and God shall exalt thee on high. 21.6, it is a light thing, refers to the charge given by God to his servant, the prophet, and through the prophet to his servant, the church, is not only to gather Israel, but to be a light to the Gentiles. Thus the gathering of Israel, as momentous, as momentous as it is, appears to be a small matter or a light thing when compared with the taking of the light of the gospel to the Gentiles. The phrase, a light to the Gentiles, refers to both Christ and Joseph Smith are spoken of as light unto the Gentiles. Similarly, all who labor to take the light of the gospel to the Gentiles are properly referred to as light unto the Gentiles. 21.7. To him whom man despised, the phrase meaning, the promise made to Joseph Smith was that his name would be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken among all people. The phrase, king shall see and arise, means again the promise 
through Joseph Smith is that the fullness of the gospel is to be proclaimed by the weak and simple unto the ends of the world and before kings and rulers. To the Nephites, Christ promised that a day would come when kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. 21 verse 8, the verse, and an acceptable time, means make haste and also proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the gospel of salvation. Is the Lord's directive to those who go forth to raise the warning voice and testify of the restoration. The phrase, I will preserve thee and give thee my servant, means those sustaining the Lord's prophets are promised a blessing of protection. I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which had come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spoke unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others, that they should proclaim these things unto the world, and all this that it might be fulfilled, which was written by the prophets. The weak things of the world shall go forth and break down the mighty and strong ones, that man should not counsel his fellow man, neither trust in the arm of flesh. The phrase for a covenant of the people means the revelation cited immediately above continues that faith also might increase in the earth, that my everlasting covenant might be established. Chapter 29, verse 9, prisoners go forth, meaning the phrase has a double meaning. It extends the teachings, the teaching of the restored gospel to both sides of the veil. The promise to those who are in prison of apostate doctrines and the bondage of false traditions is that they shall be brought out of captivity, or as Isaiah put it, out of obscurity and out of darkness. When the times of the Gentiles is come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. Their promised restoration is a return to both the fullness and of gospel principles and leads to their inheritance. The phrase also refers to the teachings of the gospel to those in the world of spirits. Let the dead speak forth anthems of eternal praise to King Emmanuel who hath ordained before the world was that which was enabled us to redeem them out of their prison for the prisoners shall go free. While his body lay in a borrowed tomb, Christ in the world of the spirits preached to the righteous dead in paradise. For among them he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to all the spirits of men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. And the chosen messengers went forth to declare the acceptable day of the Lord and proclaim liberty to the captives, who were bound even unto all who would repent of their sins and receive the gospel. Thus was Isaiah's prophecy fulfilled that liberty would be proclaimed to captives and the prison be opened to them that were bound. Chapter 21, verse 9, Their pasture shall be in, in all high places, meaning... Even before the organization of the church, the Lord told Joseph Smith that he and his followers were to declare glad tidings, to publish it upon the mountains and upon every high place among every people that thou shalt be permitted to see. After the organization of the church, this charge was given to the quorum of the twelve, who were told lie past lieth among the mountains and among many nations. Mountains have so frequently been the meeting place between God and men that temples built for the same purposes were known among the ancients as the mountain of the Lord. Since temples are the focal point of true religion, a restoration of the gospel must include the restoration of temple ritual and the return of Israel to the mountain of the Lord's house, where they can learn to walk in the paths of the God of Jacob. Chapter 21, verse 10. It is not necessarily the case that the righteous will always be spared the vicissitudes of life. The divine promise, however, is that those who die in the Lord shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. Chapter 21, verse 11, my highway shall be exalted phrase, meaning earlier Isaiah, using the metaphor of a highway, had written, and highway shall be there. 
and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but shall be for those the wayfaring men through fools, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go thereupon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joys upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. 21.12, these shall come from far, meaning Israel has been scattered among all nations, tongues, and people, and now returns from the places of its scattering. 21 verses 14 through 18, a despondent prophet supposed Israel to be forgotten of the Lord, only to receive, like the prophet's servant, the assurance that they too will ultimately triumph. Their restoration is sure. 21, 13 through 16, can a woman forget her child? That phrase meaning, just as it seems impossible for a woman to forget a nursing baby, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that it would be even more impossible for the Savior to forget us. Quote, this poetic passage provides us yet another reminder of a Christ's saving role, that of protective, redeeming parent to Zion's children. He comforts his people and shows mercy when they are afflicted, as any loving father or mother would towards a child. As Nephi here reminds us through Isaiah, much more than any mortal father or mother could do. Although a mother may forget her sucking child, as unlikely as any parent might think that could be, Christ will not forget the children he has redeemed or the covenant he has made with them. So for salvation in Zion, I made with them for salvation in Zion. The painful reminder of that watch, care, and covenant are marks of the Roman nails engraven upon the palms of his hands, a sign to his disciples in the old world, his Nephite congregation in the world, and to us in the latter days that he is the Savior of the world and was wounded in the house of his friends. 21.16, I have engraven in the palms of my hands, that phrase means, the clause is an illustration to the ancient practice of tattooing the palm with a symbol of the temple or some other sacred emblem to show devotion so that it might serve as a reminder of one's commitment. This is an idiomatic and graphic way for the Lord to say, you are constantly before me. I have not forgotten my covenant with you. 21.18, an ornament even as a bride, that phrase meaning, the return of Israel are Christ's jewels. He will adorn himself with them as a bride adorns her jewels. I will own them, the Lord declared, and they shall be mine in that day when I shall come to make up my jewels. Therefore, they must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. For all those who will not endure chastening but deny me cannot be sanctified. The phrase, I will own them, brothers and sisters, can we let Jesus Christ own us? In a sense, are you willing to be a slave of Jesus Christ? Which, if we will, he will turn us into joint heirs with him. We will only let the Savior own us if we will humble our hearts and turn our agency over to him. That is one of the things we are being tested with down here on earth. 21, 19 through 21, Zion shall flourish upon the hills and rejoice upon the mountains and shall be assembled together into the place which I have appointed, saith the Lord. The place of gathering has been established and there is none other place appointed, we are told, until the day cometh when there is found no more room for them. And then I have other places which I have appointed unto them and they shall be called stakes for the curtains or the strength of Zion. The stakes of Zion are the gathering places for latter-day Israel. 2119, in the millennial day, the earth will be renewed and its barren deserts blossom in paradisiacal splendor. Metaphorically, Israel gathers to the waters of everlasting life as they unite themselves once again in covenant with the God of their fathers. 
21, 21, the phrase, who hath begotten me, these means, all will be surprised at the great numbers of the gathering hosts of Israel. The Lord will be victorious in numbers as in all things. 21, verses 22 through 23, nursing fathers and mothers, meaning, Nephi explained that the Lord would raise up a Gentile nation to nurse scattered Israel. As part of the fulfillment of this prophecy, the gospel was restored in the United States of America, a Gentile nation. The gospel is the Lord's standard to the people, restoring the new and everlasting covenant to the children of men and feeding the need of a spiritually famished Israel scattered throughout the world. The analogy of the restoration of the gospel is that of a feast of fat things taken to the world to nurse them to spiritual health. The gospel would come forth to nourishing the spiritually famished descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, thus giving them the strength to grow to spiritual maturity. Chapter 21, verses 24 to 26. The promise granted to the returning tribes is that their enemies shall become a prey unto them. This is a reference to the destruction of the wicked, the enemies of God, at the time of the second coming. Speculative theories of various and sundry peoples going forth with a divine decree to destroy the wicked and faithless are without scriptural foundation. Further, Nephi prophesied that the mother of abominations would gather great multitudes upon the face of the earth among all nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God, and that the wrath of God would be poured out upon the great whore of all the earth, who would then war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands would fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood." And every nation which shall war against thee, O house of Israel, shall be turned one against another. And they shall fall into the pit which they dig to ensnare the people of the Lord. How fitting that those thirsting for the blood of the saints will eventually turn upon their own in that same spirit of vengeance. Our last chapter, First Nephi 22. 22, 1 through 3. No question is more basic to scriptural interpretation than the determination of whether a particular passage, story, or event, an entire block of scripture, is to be understood as figurative or literal. Having read to his brothers what we know as Isaiah chapters 48 and 49, Nephi was asked if he had read was to be understood in a figurative or literal sense. Short of the actual destruction of scriptural records, Satan has no more effective way of opposing scriptural truths than confusing the figurative and the literal. Like potter's clay, some simply mold the scriptures into the likeness of the theories of men. Conversely, by making scriptural metaphors literal, the most marvelous truths are distorted beyond recognition. The bread and wine of the sacrament are an obvious illustration. By eating the sacramental bread, do we literally eat the body of Christ? And in drinking the wine or water in a sacramental ritual, are we figuratively drinking Christ's blood or doing so literally as some suppose? Such is the issue ever present in scriptural interpretation. Is the passage, the story, or the book to be interpreted figurative or literally? In answering his brothers, Nephi explained that these prophecies of Isaiah were to be understood as being both temporal and spiritual. That is, they would literally come to pass, yet their interpretation would be, go beyond the event of their temporal fulfillment, for they carried spiritual or symbolic meanings also. Nephi further explained that it is only by the spirit of revelation that such questions can be answered, saying, for by the Spirit are all things made known unto the prophet. It takes a prophet to understand a prophet. It takes the Spirit of Revelation to understand the Spirit of Revelation. Any doctrine that seals the heavens to continuous revelation will also close the door to a proper and inspired understanding of that which has already been revealed, including, of course, our ability to rightly divide the literal from the figurative. So in essence, if we are going to know the difference, we must have the spirit of prophecy and of revelation. 
In his answer, Nephi explained that Israel must gather in a figurative sense, that is, the return to the true church, as well as in a literal sense, that is, a return to their lands of promise. Prophetic promises were often subject to both figurative and literal interpretations, and for that matter, many also have multiple fulfillments. 22, 3-4 this is a very much neglected by those who attempt to tell the story of the scattering of Israel. Or this verse is much neglected. Here Nephi, speaking nearly 600 years before the birth of Christ, indicates that the ten tribes have for the most part already been scattered to and fro upon the isles, plural, of the sea. A scholar explained the meaning of the isles of the sea. Nephi not only refers to the Isles of the Sea as the location of other remnants of the house of Israel, but he also indicates that he and his people were, there, were, were then living upon the Isle of the Sea, when he quite clearly is referring to the great landmass known as the American continent. When the resurrected Christ visited the Nephites, he told them that he was going to show himself to the lost tribes of Israel. Obviously such, a visit, obviously, such a visit would be limited to the remnant of scattered Israel worthy to stand in the presence of the resurrected Lord. And since they had already scattered themselves to and fro upon the isles of the sea, various visits would need to be made. This may account for the multitude of nations and people today who have traditions that Christ once visited them. It also ought to be observed that the life tribes are not lost in the sense that we do not know where they are. <coughs> Excuse me. The scriptures plainly tell us that they have been scattered among every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. How then are they lost? They are lost temporally in the sense that they are in many instances lost to the lands of their inheritance. Of greater importance, they are lost in a spiritual sense. They are lost to the gospel and its saving ordinances. They are lost to the priesthood and all the blessings that flow from it. They are lost in a sense of identity. They no longer know that they are the children, that they are Israel, and that God made covenants with their ancient fathers whereby they might be blessed. They are also intermingled with Gentiles of the world that they can only be identified by revelation. This revelation must come through a damned patriarch declaring to them their lineage and promised blessings as the chosen seed. But this only after they have found their way back to the fold of God. In a national sense, the Book of Mormon does much to reveal the identity of the tribes. Isaiah 22, 5. Why was Israel scattered? The answer is clear. It is plain. Of it, there is no doubt. Our Israelite forebears were scattered because they rejected the gospel, defiled the priesthood, forsook the church, and departed from the kingdom. They were scattered because they turned from the Lord, worshipped false gods, and walked in all the ways of the heathen nations. They were scattered because they forsook the Abrahamic covenant, trampled under their feet the holy ordinances, and rejected the Lord Jehovah, who was the Lord Jesus, of whom all the prophets testified. Israel was scattered for apostasy. The Lord in his wrath, because of their wickedness and rebellion, scattered them among the nation, heathens in all the nations of the earth. The phrase, these things have been prophesied concerning them, means these prophecies of Isaiah were made after the ten tribes were taken captive and apply also to those of the southern kingdom who would yet be scattered 587 B.C., even down to the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in A.D. 70. Chapter 22, verse 6 through 9, a mighty nation and a marvelous work phrase means, the phrase, the Lord God will raise up a mighty nation among the Gentiles, refers to the United States of America in 1776. The First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States included a proclamation of freedom of religion. These amendments were ratified on December 15, 1791. The Constitution of the United States was where freedom of religion first took root in the modern world. And in 1 Nephi 22.8, Nephi referred to a marvelous work among the Gentiles in the latter days. 
This great work included the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and the priesthood keys necessary to bring the covenants of God to all the nations of the earth. See verse 9. The, verse, the events in verse 7 had to precede those in verse 8. The world was typically full of countries with four state religions. For the gospel to be restored, it required a country that both legally professed and practiced freedom of religion. Joseph Smith was born in December 1805, just 14 years after the ratification of the amendment of the Constitution. Isn't it great? You can just, just in the scriptures, you can see God's hand working in the lives of the nations and of the people. Why wouldn't you want to worship a God that can control and work out things like this? Chapter 22, verse 9, the covenant of the Father unto Abraham, meaning the Lord covereth Abraham that his posterity, having the gospel of salvation and the priesthood, would thus be called upon to gather Israel from among the nations of the earth. Israel would be gathered in the last days so that the Lord might renew with them his everlasting covenant as he did anciently with Abraham. Chapter 22, verses 10 through 12. The power of God here represented as the Lord making bare his arm will be manifested by the taking of the gospel and its eternal covenants to all nations and peoples of the earth. That same God who delivered Israel from the might of Egypt will in the latter days show again his power with great miracles than those witnessed at the hands of Moses. Jeremiah recorded that the Lord's promise... The, the Lord's promise thus, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. And I will bring them again into the land that I gave unto their fathers. Jeremiah is saying that, the great gathering when the lost ten tribes and all the tribes of Israel start to be gathered will be such a grand and great momentous moment in history that we won't even think of the leaving Israel and dividing of the Red Sea as that big of a deal. This will overshadow that miracle. Missionaries must go to the lands that have not yet received them until the gospel has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall, self, shall say, The work is done. To accomplish this great work, the Lord said, I call upon the weak things of the world, those who are unlearned and despised, to thrash the nations by the power of my spirit, and their arms shall be my arm, and I will be their shield and their buckler, and I will gird up their loins, and they shall fight manfully for me, and their enemies shall be under their feet, and I will lift, let fall, and I will let fall the sword in their behalf, and by the fire of my indignation will I preserve them. Do you notice in that quote of DNC 35, 13 to 14 that talks nothing about us doing it? It's what God will do for us in helping us. 22.11, in the eyes of all nations, means there is a day to be a day, as all the faithful know, when the ends of the earth shall inquire after the name of Joseph Smith and shall seek after the glorious gospel that has been restored through his instrumentality. 22.12, 12, out of captivity, out of obscurity, out of darkness, phrases, means scattered Israel is to be freed from the captivity of ignorance and the bondage of false forms of worship. No longer are they to walk in darkness and worship gods of wood and stone or other supposed gods who have neither body parts nor passions. Their obscurity has ended, for now they know the true and living God, who is their Savior and Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. Jeremiah prophetically described this day, saying, 
O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of my affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanities, and things wherein there is no profit. Shall all man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. The phrase, land of their inheritance, meaning Israel is not together to one land alone, but to many. They have a promised inheritance in Palestine of old, while the descendants of Joseph have claim upon Americas, both north and south, and we fully expect to learn of other lands promised to various of the to various of the transplanted tribes of Israel. Chapter twenty two thirteen through fourteen The twisting winds associated with the ever destructive fires of contention will turn upon those igniting them. Wickedness will consume itself. The various elements of the church of the devil will war among themselves to the point that they will become drunken with their own blood. Indeed, all who war against the house of Israel shall fall into the pit which they dig to ensnare the people of the Lord, and all who fight against Zion shall be destroyed. The great and the abominable church will at this time, just prior to the millennium, be destroyed, and in the midst of it all, the Lord will preserve and defend his people as he did anciently. Chapter 22, verse 14, the phrase, All that fight against Zion shall be destroyed meaning Israel's triumph over her enemies will occur not because her marching armies def defeat their foes and battles, but because her enemies, the Gentiles, the great and abominable church, the nations that fight against God, call them what you will, the meaning is the same, will be destroyed simply because every corruptible thing will be consumed at the second coming. In the day the Lord will truly fight the battles of his saints, for as he descends from heaven amid fire and burning, all the proud and they that do wickedly shall burn as stubble. Chapter 22.15, The Prophet Apparently, Zenos is the prophet that Nephi is quoting. It appears also that Malachi has either quoted Zenos or received an independent revelation in the same terms. The phrase Satan shall have no more power refers to Satan is to be bound by the power of God. It will not be by a state of righteousness, purity, or goodness that will bind Satan at the beginning of the millennium. Near countless passages of scripture assure us that the return of Christ will be in a day of wickedness and corruption and that he will come to take vengeance upon the wicked. So it is Christ who will first bind Satan, and then that which keeps him bound will be the righteousness of the saints. But that comes after first Christ has bound him. Elder Bruce R. McConkey noted, It is one of the sad heresies of our time that peace will be gained by weary diplomats as they prepare treatises of compromise or that the millennium will be bustered in because men will learn to live in peace and to keep the commandments, or that the predicted plagues and promised desolations of latter days can in some way be avoided. We must do all we can to proclaim peace, to avoid war, to heal disease, to prepare for natural disasters. But with it all, that which is to be shall be. In other words... We are, people are not going to just on their own become righteous. Nations aren't going to just on their own start loving each other together and working because of great diplomatic matters. No, it will be because Christ will come and destroy the telestial wicked and bind Satan. Chapter 22, 15, they must be burned. In response to the often asked question, is the burning spoken of in this passage that of a literal fire? The author responds, no more so than the waters of the flood in the days of Noah were literal waters. It is requisite that as the earth is returned to its paradisiacal or terrestrial glory, that all things of lower, lower orders be purged from it. So yes, it will be a literal 
fire, just like it was literal waters in Noah's day. 22, 16 through 17, the saints are preserved by the hand of God, not by personal righteousness. Righteousness is a companion to faith, and together these principles open the heavens so that God's blessings may be poured upon the saints. The blessings, however, come from God, not from the goodness and righteousness of the saints. We acknowledge the hand of God in all things. 2117 by fire, meaning the destruction of the enemies of the people of God by fire, is a direct reference to the destruction of the wicked at the second coming. As the earth was baptized by water in the days of Noah, so will it yet be baptized by fire and the Holy Ghost so that it might commence its millennial Sabbath in purity. 22, 17, verse 22, the phrase, the righteous need not fear, meaning, while Nephi recorded that the righteous need not fear because the Lord's protective hand will be over them during the calamities of the last days, the wicked have no promise of protection from these events. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, we do not say that all the saints will be spared and saved from the coming day of desolation, but we do say there is no promise of safety and no promise of security except for those who love the Lord and who are seeking to do all that he commands, end of quote. Chapter 28, verse 18, blood and fire and vapors of smoke, phrase, meaning this may refer to nuclear warfare. Again, quoting Elder McConkie, it may be, for instance, that nothing except the power of faith and the authority of the priesthood can save individuals and congregations from the atomic holocaust that surely shall be. End of quote. The phrase, if it so be, meaning, this is a conditional prophecy, it need not be. God does not will it upon his children on earth, but they bring it upon themselves through wickedness. The phrase, harden their hearts against the Holy One of Israel, refers to, there are no blessings in rejecting God, Christ, the gospel, or any of its saving ordinance. In the stead of blessings come everlasting cursings. Of those he has sent forth bearing his message in the last days, the Lord has says, to them is power given to sow both on earth and in heaven. The unbelieving and rebellious, yea, verily, to sow up a Sell them up unto the day when the wrath of God shall be poured out upon the wicked without measure, unto the day when the Lord shall come to recompense unto every man according to his work, and measure to every man according to the measure which he has measured to his fellow man. 22 verse 19, the phrase, All, that, all they who fight against Zion shall be cut off. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall burn as stubble. For they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Those left without root or branch are those who have rejected the sealing powers of the priesthood, and thus are cut off from the eternal family unit. By extension, to reject those whom Christ has commissioned to testify him is to reject him and thus to be cut off from among the people of the covenant. 20 verse, 22 verse 20, like unto me, phrase referring to, to dramatize to his people what the Messiah would be like, Moses said that he will be like unto me. The expression is most appropriate. While standing face to face with God, Moses was told, Thou art in the similitude of my only begotten. To Israel, Moses was a miracle worker, redeemer, deliverer, liberator, mediator of the covenant, lawgiver, revelator, prophet, priest, and king. In each of these things and in many more, he was a prophetic foreshadowing of what the Christ would be. All prophets, for those of their own day, are types or living prophecies of Christ for what Christ is. For that matter, every man who holds and honors the priesthood typifies what Christ is. 22, verses 22 to 23. There can be as only one true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. Nephi, apparently using the words of Zenos, characterized those churches which are not the Lord's church as including the desire to gain wealth, power, and worldly prestige, the lusts of the flesh, and to do all manner of iniquity. What a shame it is that such things are done in the name of the Lord. 
Such are among the corruptible things that will be destroyed before the earth can receive again its paradisiacal glory and enjoy its millennial splendor. Chapter 22, verse 24, Calves of the Stall. President Joseph Finley Smith taught that children will be raised during the millennium, shall grow up as calves of the stall unto righteousness, that is, without sin or the temptations which are so prevalent today. Contemplate the difference between a calf that is raised out on the range or in the mountains and one that is raised in a barn. The calf on the range is subject to all the foes of nature, inclement weather, predatory animals, and occasional scarcity of food and water. On the other hand, the calf raised in the barn or in a stall is protected from poor weather and predatory animals. Likewise, food and water are regularly provided. Nephi taught that the time that comes speedily that the righteous must be led up, at, led up as calves of the stall. One commentator said, those who are left after the judgment of the second coming will be able to raise up their children as calves are raised in a stall. The calf is protected from the elements and his environment is controlled. The children in the millennium will similarly grow up without sin unto salvation. The telestial element will be removed, and with Satan being bound, the environment will be more controlled. Boy, what a great time to raise a family. Second Nephi 25, 22 verse 25, the phrase, He gathers his children, meaning the greater part of the gathering of Israel will not take place until the millennial era. The great grand gathering that will be such a miracle that will foreshadow the coming out of Egypt will not take place until the millennial era. The phrase from the four quarters of the earth, meaning the message of the restoration, will have spread to all the lands. The Book of Mormon, in concert with the Bible, repetitiously affirms that Israel, the ten tribes included, will be scattered among all nations. The scriptures do not sustain popular expressions which suppose that the lost tribes are anywhere other than scattered among the nations on earth. They will be gathered by the preaching of the elders of the church, the prophets among them, into the congregation of the saints then established, then established in their lands. The phrase, his sheep know him, meaning these are they whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The phrase, one fold and one shepherd, refers to, in the full and complete sense, Israel are of one fold and have one shepherd only when their faith and actions are in perfect unity with that of their master. Chapter 22, 26, the phrase, how will Satan be bound? Nephi gave a very clear definition of script, in scripture of how Satan is to be bound during the millennium. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote the following explanation concerning this important verse, quote, what does it mean to bind Satan? How is he bound? Our revelation says, and in the, that day Satan shall not have power to tempt man. Does this mean that power is withdrawn from Satan so that he can no longer entice men to do evil? Or does it mean that men no longer succumb to his enticements because their hearts are so set on righteousness that they refuse to forsake that which is good to follow him who is evil? Clearly it means the latter. Satan was not bound in heaven in the very presence of God, in, in the sense that he was denied the right and power to preach false doctrine and to invite men to walk away from God, whose children they were. Nay, in this sense, he could not have been bound in heaven, for even he must have his agency. I think that should read, in the sense that he was not denied the right and power to preach false doctrine. He had, he had his agency to do that. That was a typo on my part. How then will Satan be bound during the millennium? It will be by the righteousness of the people. This is once after Christ has bound him. And then he will be kept bound by the righteousness of the people. The millennium will be ushered in with power. Christ will bind Satan with his power. And then maintained by the righteousness of the people. 2226, he cannot be loosed for many years, meaning when the thousand years or millennium is ended, Satan will be loosed and men will again begin to deny their God and the Lord will spare the earth but for a little season. 
the Holy One of Israel reign of phrase meaning. From Joseph Smith we learn that Christ and the resurrected saints will reign over the earth during the thousand years. They will not probably dwell upon the earth, but will visit it when they please or when it is necessary to govern it. 22 verses 27 to 31. Nephi, following the prophetic pattern, sealed his teachings to his brothers with his testimony. That testimony included the verity of the scriptural record available to them. He enjoined his brothers to be obedient so that they might enjoy the fullness of gospel blessings. 22-27, the phrase, according to the flesh, meaning these things are not figurative, their fulfillment will be literal. Well, that was a lot. And there is a lot in there for us to liken to ourselves. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.